welcome to Science Gallery Bengaluru's fifth exhibition and our third online exhibition, Cycle. We have 10 exhibits, 25 lectures and tutorials in English and Kannada, 13 workshops and masterclasses, six film screenings and discussions, six performances, 10 events, and 100 plus mediator led sessions. This time, we are working with our content partners, the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, NIMHANS, as we Bangaloreans know it. Museum, Dr. Gislain from Ghent and the Wellbeing Project. Our program partners are the India Alliance. Our academic advisors have been the neuroscientist Richard Bingate, psychiatrist Sanjeev Jain, the psychologist Ulrika Kluger and psychiatrist Vikram Patel. Our curatorial advisors have been Jill Bennett, Marius Quint, Natasha Jinwala and Ruth Garden. We at Science Gallery Bengaluru are privileged to have been established by the government of Karnataka and our board has representatives from the government, industry and academia. A line that you will hear me say again and again as you return to us over the next 45 days is the sheer complexity and the wonder of the human mind. We perceive perception. We use our mind to understand the mind. It is quite a curious situation. May I now call upon Professor Vijay Chandru to launch the exhibition. Professor Chandru is an academic and an entrepreneur. His academic career in decision, his academic career in decision sciences spanned over four decades at Purdue University and at the Indian Institute of Science. His training in electrical engineering at Bits Pilani and operational research at UCLA and MIT led him to explore academic research at the interface of computational mathematics with geometry, logic, machine learning, biology, and heritage art. A fellow of both academies of science and engineering in India, he's an emeritus distinguished technologist of the Indian National Academy of Engineering and executive advisor of Art Park at the Indian Institute of Science. Over to you, Chandru, for your opening remarks and to declare the exhibition open. Good evening. Um, and thank you, Janavi, Madhu, and Yamuna, and the rest of the Science Gallery team for this excellent new exhibition, and also inviting me to make the opening remarks. Um, I'm trained in computational mathematics, as uh, Janavi mentioned. Uh, which I have also been applying to life and health sciences um, over the last couple of decades. And when I heard about the plans for Psyche, um, which I understand as uh, the totality of elements forming the mind, my uh, first thoughts uh, went to recent conversations with investor communities. Um, uh, in biotechnology, uh, we're really excited about the mainstreaming of psychedelics um, as uh, pharmacology for mental health uh, issues. So when Janvi asked me to give these remarks, I, I thought I could be uh, um, a Timothy Leary of this millennium on uh, hearing my plan. Uh, a friend even advised, um, well, you know, just pop a pill and see how it goes. But... <laughs> Uh, of course, I won't do that. Um, and my intellectual conscience sort of steered me uh, towards my own training in computing. And so instead of psychedelics, I, I will briefly examine the question, is my psyche computable? Um, there's a good reason to ask this question, which actually stems from a uh, tradition of uh, computational positivism. Uh, that define classical Indian science. This tradition is well researched and uh, <clears throat> documented by our intellectual mentor and hero, uh, the late Professor Rodham Narsimha. Um, two decades back when I served on the faculty at, uh, at the National Institute of Advanced Studies that he headed, um, I'm sure, he would have asked me to speak on this topic if, if it had arisen in conversation. So these remarks are in some way uh, my eulogy for uh, Professor 
uh, Narsimha. Um, in order to address the question, uh, is my psyche computable? Uh, I went back to the master, um, Alan Turing, and re-examined his treatise published in Mind um, in 1950, in which he raised the question, um, can machines think? Um, most of us remember this paper uh, of Turing um, for uh, the, the imitation game, uh, which he introduced uh, there. Um, this game played uh, by a human, a computer, and an interrogator um, is, uh, is now well known as the Turing test, right? The objective of the human is to get the interrogator to uh, choose correctly uh, who answered as human and who as machine. Uh, while the objective of the computer is to get the opposite. Um, there's a lot more to how the game is set up and run and so forth, but uh, you know, this is more or less the gist of it. Um, and many claims and counterclaims have been made about computers at IBM and DeepMind passing the test uh, in domains of chess, Jeopardy and most recently um, Go uh, with flying colors. Um, and, uh, but as I re-examined the paper, I found that Turing um, had actually delved a lot deeper um, than just uh, this game playing. And, um, and his insights on the question, can computers think basically gave me some clues on my question, uh, is my psyche computable? Uh, Turing laid out a, a list of possible objections that may be raised on his claim that machines can win the imitation game once the capacity of these machines um, reaches uh, approximately the ability to process 10 to the nine bits of information, uh, which, uh, you know, at that point was uh, uh, considered the size of the encoding of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, incidentally, some 60 years later, scientists at TJ Watson at IBM did something similar. They trained Watson to read and digest the contents of Wikipedia before challenging the world champions in a, in a game of Jeopardy. Um, so Turing uh, laid out his, uh, uh, his belief that, uh, you know, actually there would be computers that would uh, win the imitation game uh, with about 70% accuracy. Uh, he felt by the end of the millennium, uh, that is, uh, you know, around 2000. Uh, but his list of objections um, that uh, uh, he laid out on, uh, uh, you know, why people might say that uh, this is not possible um, are most interesting. And let me just list them uh, one after the other. Um, the first objection uh, might be the theological one. Um, so, you know, there's no immortal soul that the machine has from God. And, and so, you know, machines are different from, from men. And, um, and so uh, machines can't think. Uh, the heads in the sand objection, uh, um, this would be too dreadful uh, uh, to consider and hope it never happens. Um, the mathematical objection, um, Goodell's theorem and undecidability, which of course Turing was well equipped uh, to answer. Uh, the argument from consciousness, um, can, can a computer write a sonnet or compose a concerto with feelings? Um, of course, uh, Francis Crick and Roger Penrose had a lot to say about this later on. Um, 
arguments from disabilities of computers. Uh, computers can't enjoy strawberries and cream. So uh, again, you know, a serious objection. Uh, Lady Lovelace's objection, which uh, uh, could be characterized as analytic engines um, can only do what uh, they are instructed to. Um, analog versus digital uh, and on neurological systems uh, truly analog. Uh, well, you know, I think uh, uh, there are of course machines that can uh, that can be analog as well, uh, like the differential analyzers and so on. Um, at that time. Um, uh, the informality of behavior argument uh, following a rigid set of rules makes uh, a man no better than a machine. Uh, so, um, so, you know, rules will have to be flexible and then can a machine really um, work with that, right? Um, the um, argument from extrasensory perception uh, telepathy, clairvoyance, pre-recognition, and psychokinesis. And here, of course, uh, uh, Turek did uh, say that uh, if telepathy is ad admitted, then the Turing test will need to be tightened up. Competitors um, may need to be placed in telepathy-free rooms. Um, Turing ends his extraordinary treatise often considered the real foundation stone of artificial intelligence with an exceptional idea. The idea is to create a child computer and then make it learn. And Turing goes on to outline how machine learning may be facilitated. Uh, well, I shall leave it there and ask you to read the original um, and enjoy the rest of the program on Psyche, that science gallery, Bengaluru has curated brilliantly for you, beginning with the opening lecture by Stellar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chandra, for starting the program on a, on a, on a nice and edgy note. And I, I could hear Stellar having a chuckle in the background, and I look forward to how he has to respond to what you have shared with us. So, now on to today's lecture. Split body, synthetic self, excess and emptiness. Stellark is a stellar performance artist who has visually probed and acoustically amplified his own body. His projects explore alternative anatomical architectures. He has performed with a third hand, a stomach sculpture and a six legged walking robot. In the year 2006, and year was surgically constructed on his arm. In Rewired, Remixed 2016, he could only see with the eyes of someone in London, could only hear with the ears of someone in New York, but anyone, anywhere could access his, his right arm and remain remotely actuated, a disembodied self. In 2015, he received the Australia Council's Emerging and Experimental Arts Award. We are showing a compilation of his work at Psyche in an exhibit, uh, in an exhibit entitled Synthetic Self. I'm sure he's going to have incredibly fabulous things to sh share with us this evening. Stella, a welcome to you, and we look forward to your lecture. Well, thank you for your kind introduction. Um, I'll, I'll begin by sharing my screen. So thank you, and I'm delighted to be participating in, in Psyche. Um, these projects and performances problematize what a body is and how a body operates in the world. I guess they, um, they, they interrogate issues of uh, embodiment, um, aliveness, um, agency, um, and in fact, the more and more performances I do, the less and less I think I have a mind of my own, nor any mind at all in the uh, traditional uh, metaphysical sense. So when, when this person speaks about the body, uh, this person speaks about this physiological, phenomenological, interacting, 
an aware body in the world. I make no Cartesian distinction between mind and body or between the self and, and the soma. So for me, the psyche or the self is socially constructed, it's culturally conditioned, and is a historically contingent construct. And as this uh, forward-facing bipedal body with two eyes and two ears to navigate and two limbs to manipulate, um, you know, the self is constructed as, a, as this intentional agent uh, with a past, in other words, what goes on before me, and a future, what this body um, expects moving uh, forwards. The body is forward-facing and thus metaphorically uh, future-oriented. You know, we look um, uh, towards uh, possible futures. The self experiences the world as what it has recently forgotten and what it now imagines or expects. So rather than uh, seeing the self as an intrinsic essence, it should be seen more as a dynamically evolving and uh, an unstable construct. The body's lived experience is one of a relationship with time, space, surface, and uh, social interaction. And we should always remember that to be an intelligent agent, we need to be both embodied and embedded in the world. Of course, we may be differently embodied than we are now, but we need to be embodied and embedded. The face from the donor body stitched to the skull of the recipient becomes a kind of third face resembling neither. So we're in this time of circulating flesh. We can take an organ from one body and insert it into another body. We can take the a cat of the hands and stitch them onto the limbs of an amputee and animate those hands. Um, I met the first double hand transplant patient in a medical conference in Paris. And what was interesting was that after only six months, uh, he could make rudimentary movements with his uh, cat of the hands and he also had a sensation of texture, pressure, and temperature. And of course, now we can preserve dead bodies forever uh, with plastination and um, display them anatomically in ways that we couldn't before. But at the same time, we can sustain a comatose body. Um, with the technological life support system, whilst simultaneously cryogenically preserved bodies await reanimation at some imagined future. So cadavers no longer need to disintegrate. Comatose bodies need not die. And between uh, 1973 and 1975, I made three films of the inside of my body. So for the first time, I experienced my body not as a surface of skin, but rather as an internal architecture of structures, spaces, and circulatory systems. And 20 years later, <laughs> for the fifth Australian sculpture triennial, whose theme was site-specific works, instead of a, a sculpture for a public space, I decided to design a sculpture for a private physiological space, a stomach sculpture. 
So as a closed capsule, uh, it could be inserted down the esophagus into the stomach cavity. Uh, but inside the stomach, it could open and close, extend and retract, had a flashing light and a beeping sound. So here, the body is not a site for the psyche, nor for social inscription. The body is simply a site for a sculpture. The body becomes a host for its own work of art. So ontologically and technologically, there's no longer any meaningful distinction between internal and external spaces of the body. Technology increasingly makes the body transparent. Um, and also increasingly, there's less and less distinction between the living and the dead. In other words, um, between um, having a material existence and retaining that material existence. And as Nietzsche points out, the living are only a species of the dead. <laughs> um, between 1976 and 1989, I did uh, 27 uh, body suspension performances with insertions into the skin. Uh, this is in a lift well, um, counterbalanced by a ring of rocks, one rock for each insertion point. In fact, the body was gently swaying from side to side, setting up random oscillations in the rocks. Um, unfortunately, uh, the performance was terminated early when the telephone rang in the gallery, <laughs> sort of breaking the kind of meditative moment. A performance um, suspended on an outcrop of rocks, uh, looking out to sea. Uh, the only uh, people who saw this performance were a group of fishermen on a nearby outcrop of rocks. They were fishing before we arrived. They were fishing uh, during the suspension and they kept fishing <laughs> when we were leaving. Um, so you have, to, uh, you have to accept that these suspensions are experiences merely in bodily sensation. They're expressed in bodily action, in remote spaces and in diverse situations. They're not actions for interpretation. Interpretation is not necessary, nor do they uh, need any explanation. They're not meant to generate any meaning. Uh, these are sites of inertia and states of erasure. A performance in Copenhagen, uh, the body was suspended 60 metres above the Royal Theatre. Um, after about 30 metres, all I could hear was the whooshing of the wind, the whirring of the crane motors and the creaking of the skin. And in New York, over East 11th Street, uh, the body was suspended um, for only 12 minutes because the police arrived very quickly and I was arrested um, not for performing an act of public nudity, not for performing a sadomasochistic action, but rather uh, that I was a danger to the public, <laughs> you know, had I fallen on someone. But, you know, these early uh, suspension performances um, really um, exposed the inadequacies of the human body, uh, the vulnerability of the body. Um, it was a kind of an unsettling experience uh, to sort of de-center the body to, to, to uh, make it vulnerable. And so there was a desire to augment the body in some way. Uh, the third hand was the first uh, augmentation that uh, was engineered. Um, it's only three degrees of freedom, a pinch release, a grasp release, a 300 degree wrist rotation, 
clockwise and counterclockwise, but it also had a tactile feedback system for a sense of touch. You know, sophisticated enough at the time to get invitations from the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena and the Johnson Space Center in Houston to demonstrate the hand to the extra vehicular activity group. The hand is actuated by uh, EMG uh, signals, uh, electrical signals from the muscles, and by using the, the abdominal and leg muscles, uh, these um, uh, three hands could uh, operate independently of, of each other. So at first, the hand was... Uh, to the body. But I did uh, learn to write a couple of words, evolution and decadence, because these were both nine letter words. <laughs> but um, each hand here is writing a separate letter simultaneously. I had to keep my two eyes on what my three hands were doing. And because of the spacing of the three hands, I had to remember which letter I was writing. I was writing every third letter with each of the, the hands. So the body now has become this contemporary chimera of meat, metal, and code. The body performs now beyond the boundaries of its skin and beyond the local space that it inhabits. Uh, this performance began when the body was switched on and the performance ended when the body was switched off. The sounds you heard were from brainwave signals, a heartbeat, a blood flow and muscle, uh, muscle signals. So the body was acoustically amplified and extended and immersed the audience in the performance. Uh, laser beams were directed to the eyes via optic fiber cable. And by controlling the muscles around the eyes, you could scribble, um, uh, scribble images with the laser beams. In other words, the eyes were not merely passive receptors of light and images. Uh, here, the eyes become active transmitters and generators of images. So I have to point out that at a time here when the individual body can be threatened existentially by fatally being infected by biological viruses, what becomes apparent now is that the human species is confronted by the more pervasive, invasive, ontological risk of infection by its digital entities and viral algorithms. I think this is a good thing. <laughs> the extended arm uh, is an 11 degree of freedom manipulator. Um, it has a uh, wrist rotation, thumb rotation, individual finger flexion, but each finger splits open. So each finger is a gripper in itself. But whilst my right arm is extended to primate proportions, my left arm is involuntarily performing for the four hour performance uh, via a computer program muscle stimulation system. But you know, it didn't take much imagination that if you could um, program a body to perform involuntarily in a local space, you could do this remotely. And um, this is the uh, muscle stimulation control box, the blue switches indicate which muscles could be programmed by touching the muscles on the computer model. The computer model simulates the choreography that you've, uh, that you've programmed. Second later in Luxembourg, where my body was, 
the body moves involuntarily. So this was in 1995, uh, but people, Pompidouna in Paris, the Media Lab in Helsinki, the Doors of Perception Conference in Amsterdam were able to remotely access via the touchscreen and remotely activate my body elsewhere. A kind of split body experience because the left side of my body um, was performing involuntarily whilst the right side was activating a third hand. So we've now become split bodies. I don't mean split mind and body. I'm split physical bodies. Um, in other words, the possibility that someone might access a part of your body and perform an action remotely elsewhere. So we now navigate from physical nanoscales to virtual non-places. The body increasingly inhabits abstract realms of the highly hypothetical and of streaming subjectivity. The body is a kind of hyperhuman that becomes less than the sum of its hyperlinks. If we can speak of an experience of self, it is a synthetic one, always being remixed and reimagined. Instead of people in other places are remotely activating the body, with Ping Body, we used the Ping protocol, pinged 30 global locations uh, during the, the performance. The reverberating pings measured in milliseconds were mapped to the body's muscles, and the body becomes a kind of crude barometer of internet activity. The body moves according to um, the, the amount of internet activity that's been measured um, in, in different domains. Parasite uh, was another uh, performance where the body performed involuntarily, but here we customized a search engine that scans the net, selects anatomical images from the web, projects them to my head up display. The images are analyzed for the complexity and the images that I see are the images that move me. So as well as being in, a, in, a, in an age of circulating flesh, we're also in an age of fractal flesh. And by fractal flesh, I mean bodies and bits of bodies spatially separated but electronically connected, generating recurring patterns of interactivity at varying scales. And that's just merely a definition of the internet. But now presence becomes problematic. Presence is now marked by a double absence or perhaps absence is marked by a double presence. We are neither all here now, nor all there all of the time, but partly here sometimes and partly somewhere else at other times. Movitar was an inverse motion capture system. Instead of uh, my body animating my avatar via some, some uh, computer interface, Imagine if an avatar imbued with genetic algorithms was able to uh, evolve its behavior during the performance, and this avatar could access the upper part of my body and perform with it in the real world. So the upper part of my body via the exoskeleton is avatar driven. Whilst the lower part of my body, um, I, can, I can use with my own agency. So another split body, but instead of left 
and right, um, the body here is split between the upper and lower uh, parts. Um, a project that I initiated at Brunel University, which I think is still a PhD uh, 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 project, uh, imagine a hand that can, uh, is double jointed. The fingers can bend one way, the thumb can rotate, you have a right hand, but the fingers can bend completely the other way. So you have a left hand and a right hand all in the one kind of universal uh, design. Um, it's actuated by pneumatic rubber muscle. And uh, the idea would be to also embed a webcam in its palm to have an eye in hand, a manipulator, <laughs> a mobile uh, eye in hand manipulator. So the body extruded into non-places and task envelopes of virtuality and information overload, extending its sense of self, the body experiences itself as empty, but not an emptiness from any lack, but rather an emptiness through excess, through an excess of technological paraphernalia, devices, implants, attachments. Um, it interestingly uh, hollows out the human body. Uh, the sense of self is extruded beyond uh, its skin. A performance with a six-legged walking robot the robot is robust enough to take the artist's body weight, but by making different gestures, the sensor system of the upper body exoskeleton allows the artist to select the different walking um, motions. So the robot can walk forwards with a ripple gait, sideways with a tripod gait. The robot can squat it can stand, it can turn on the spot. The muscle machine is a five meter diameter walking robot, five meters diameter. Um, it's actuated by uh, pneumatic rubber muscles and it translates human bipedal gait into a six legged insect like locomotion. So how do, how, how do you experience navigating in a space uh, with six legs? And uh, with encoders on the leg joints, for example, by simply stepping up and down, three robot legs lift and swing forward, but three robot legs are always on the ground, so the robot remains uh, stable. So all of these projects and performances are about exploring alternative anatomical architectures. Why only, you know, uh, two ears, uh, two hands? Uh, why only two legs? Um, I was very interested in comparative anatomies, um, very fascinated with insect and animal locomotion. And this informed me as to other kinds of experiences that living things um, construct of the world. You know, uh, insects and animals have uh, a different, uh, different kind of umwelt, a different kind of world experience than, than humans. And perhaps we can incorporate some of these sensor uh, manipulation and locomotion possibilities into the human body. Uh, the walking head is a, uh, a six-legged uh, robot with a human head displayed. It has a rotating uh, ultrasound sensor. It detects if someone is close to the robot. If someone approaches the robot, the robot stands, selects from its library of movements, 
and performs a, 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 a choreography of about a minute, a minute and a half. Then it sits down, goes to sleep and waits until it detects the next person to come along. The intent here was, in fact, to engineer an actual virtual system where the mechanical movements of the legs, the choreography of the legs would modulate um, the behaviour, the facial expressions of the head. The Microbot is a project that's still ongoing. It's a project that hasn't been completed uh, because of uh, various attempts were unsuccessful. The idea here, though, is to construct a robot small enough and robust enough to climb up my tongue and into my mouth. I just have to be careful not to swallow. <laughs> but this is a, an aesthetic gesture as to our increasing intimacy uh, with our technology, uh, with micro sensors, with nanobots. Um, in the near future, we'll be able to effectively recolonize the human body, um, augmenting our bacterial and viral population. Um, perhaps we don't need more surveillance systems in our external environment, but we certainly need more surveillance internally because we do not have an early alert warning system when something pathological is happening at a cellular level. By the time you feel the lump in your chest, it's too late. The cancer has spread, it's metastasized. Um, and at that period of time, it's probably terminal. So if we can detect um, uh, pathology at a cellular level and we can be alerted of it, it would be much easier to uh, target and eradicate the beginnings of those cancerous cells. But actually, more interestingly, <laughs> aside from the medical possibilities, we might be able to redesign the human body atoms up, inside out. You would not feel what was happening. Of course, what's happening is invisibly occurring inside your body, one atom at a time. Um, and until the uh, changes appear at surface level, um, you wouldn't be aware of the redesign uh, occurring. <laughs> so anyway, in this age of body hacking, gene mapping, prosthetic augmentation, organ swapping, face transplants, synthetic skin, what it means to be a body, what it means to be human, and what generates aliveness and agency becomes problematic. So in the spaces of, of, of this proliferating prosthetic bodies, partial life, and artificial life, the body has become a profoundly obsolete. Now, the problem with um, interacting with human-like robots, according to Maury's notion of the uncanny valley, is as you um, engineer a more and more human-like robot, it becomes more and more creepy to interact with. Now, is this a, a philosophical barrier? Um, I feel it's just a state of the art of technology problem. Um, and of course, the problem is not only creepy robots. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you are socially inept, uh, if you have a stammer, if I am schizophrenic, you know, I will also appear creepy uh, to other people. So it's not only a robot problem. Uh, but two statements, philosophical statements by Nietzsche and Wittgenstein uh, reveal how we might, uh, how we might consider um, the notion of agency, the notion of intelligence uh, with human-like robots. 
uh, with Nietzsche, there's no being behind the doing. We attribute agency retroactively. And with Wittgenstein, uh, you don't have to locate thinking inside your head. Thinking happens with the lips that you speak, with the hands that you write or type. So I think these two statements are revealing um, so that in a way we can put aside the problematics of uh, imagining internal agency, um, you know, internal minds, internal selves. You know, if a robot performs adequately, if a robot um, uh, responds in the appropriate social interaction, if the robot speaks your language, this artist doesn't think uh, this body has a mind of its own. With the partial head, we scanned an artist's face. We scanned a hominid skull. The human face was then digitally transplanted over the hominid skull, constructing this composite um, post-human, uh, post-hominid, but pre-human face. Um, the scaffold uh, was 3D printed and then was seeded with living cells. So this partial head becomes a partial portrait of the artist, which is partially living for a for a brief time until it got contaminated and had to be fixed in formaldehyde for the rest of the exhibition. We can now instantly scan and generate hyperreal skins. Um, in fact, at an audio visual level, you will not be able to tell the difference um, between an actual person and their animated skin if adequate morph targets enable lit real time lip syncing um, and, and, uh, and an array of facial expressions. But now uh, we are mediated uh, by screens. Skins become screens. In fact, screens now are our skins. We no longer caress skins, we caress our, our screens. This is also a time not only of circulating flesh, not only of fractal flesh, but also of phantom flesh. You know, we're haunted by our phantoms online. The body experiences itself as its phantom. And by phantom here, I don't mean as phantasmatic, more as phantom limb. As these phantoms proliferate, um, as more and more haptic devices um, uh, come into use, uh, these phantoms will uh, have a much more potent physical presence and attachments to our bodies with more high fidelity uh, feedback loops. But anyway, to others online, over time, the body appears flickering on and off as a kind of digital noise, as a kind of glitch in biological time. Uh, with another artist, Nina Sellers, we both underwent a liposuction to extract 4.6 litres of our biomaterial. Uh, this was inserted in an installation titled Blender. This was the inverse of the stomach sculpture. Instead of a machine choreography inside a soft organ of the body, uh, here a machine installation becomes the host for a liquid body composed of biomaterial from the two artists' bodies. Um, it's anthropomorphic in scale 
and it has an array of proximity sensors uh, uh, that when you approach the installation, it detects if someone is, is close and the blender blades are activated uh, to mix the biomaterial. If we can engineer an artificial womb and bring to bear a healthy child, then life would not begin with a biological birth. And if we can replace malfunctioning parts of the body with stem cell grown organs, 3D bioprinted and artificial parts, then we need not die a biological death. So how then do we define human existence as neither beginning with birth nor necessarily ending in death? In fact, we will no longer die biological deaths. We die when our life support systems are switched off. In 2017, um, a US uh, woman, Tina Gibson, successfully gave birth to her daughter, Emma Wren, conceived from a 25-year-old frozen embryo. Tina Gibson was also 25 years old. We can imagine that uh, embryos will be uh, made viable as much as, say, 50 years. And if that's the case, we will begin desynchronizing our reproductive processes from an individual existence. So your twin brother might be born on your deathbed. You might be born decades after the death of your mother. The extra was first imaged as an ear on the side of my head, but this was a dumb anatomical uh, sight because of the possibility of partial face paralysis doing the surgery there. Uh, but in 2006, we found three surgeons um, and the funding to surgically construct an ear on my arm. Um, we uh, inserted a biopolymer porous scaffold uh, beneath the skin. The skin is suctioned over the scaffold. And after a period of six months, you have tissue ingrowth and vascularization occurring. So it becomes a living part of your, your body. So the ear has been replicated, relocated, and the intent is still to uh, wire the ear to electronically augment the ear to turn it into a remote listening device for people in other places. The idea is that you can log in and listen to what the ear is hearing wherever I am, wherever you are. So the body is no longer an object of desire, but rather an object that should be redesigned. <laughs> um, a four metre long sculpture of the ear on my arm, a performance lying on the ear on arm sculpture, uh, a kind of counterpoint between a whole physical body and a much larger fragment of a body, the arm with the ear on it. But whilst I was lying on the sculpture, I thought it would be really interesting uh, to suspend my body above the sculpture. Um, and this performance began when the body was hoisted off the sculpture, uh, when the cable supporting the body uh, assumed the full weight of the body, because the cable is, is st a steel cable, that's braided, it begins to untwist. And as it untwists, the body begins to spin on its own, first in one direction, then in the other direction. I thought the spinning might uh, happen for five minutes 
Um, the spinning happened for 15 minutes. Um, and when the body stopped spinning, it was lowered down back onto the sculpture. And that was the end of the performance. Here, though, the body is attached to an industrial robot arm. And uh, the body's position orientation, the body's velocity, the body's trajectory could be precisely programmed. So the body here becomes an extended operational system of bodily metabolism, machine musculature, and computational programming. And when the body completed its performance, it was replaced by a large sculpture of the artist's ear. Um, what's interesting is that the robot that choreographs the ear is the same robot that carved the ear. Uh, effectively, the industrial robot arm was a six degree of freedom CNC machine that carved the sculpture. So for me, there was always a ghost in the machine, but not as a vital force that animates, but rather as a fading attestation of the human. Stickman is a minimal, a simple minimal, but full body exoskeleton that algorithmically actuates the body for a five hour continuous performance, uh, but one leg was free. I had to have one leg to balance on, um, but this allowed me to pivot on that leg and to modify my sculpture, my shadow, and modulate my uh, uh, video feedback projection. So this performance or this body was again a kind of split body, uh, both a possessed and performing body, possessed algorithmically and with the exoskeleton and able to perform with one leg. And in a recent iteration of this performance, we engineered a mini stick man. So uh, visitors to the gallery could bend the limbs of the mini stick man, press the play switch, and insert their choreography into the performance. A kind of electronic voodoo. <laughs> So in the liminal spaces of proliferating partial life, synthetic life, and machine life, the body has become a floating signifier, an empty signifier. The body now is no body at all. In fact, the body can be anybody at all. The exoskeleton arm was engineered for the rewired, remixed, performance for five days, six hours, uh, every day continuously. I could only see with the eyes of someone in London. I could only hear with the ears of someone in New York. But anyone anywhere could access my right arm and remotely choreograph its movements. So it was a kind of sharing of visual and acoustical senses and an outsourcing of agency. And body was literally in three places at once. Two places virtually in London and New York, one place fitly in Perth at the Perth Institute of Contemporary Art. And for the 2020 Adelaide Biennial of Australian Art, we engineered a nine metre long, four metre high stick figure robot that continuously rotated on its axis with six degrees of, uh, of freedom uh, with its limbs. It had online interaction again, so people online could see the robot uh, with live video streaming. And by clicking um, uh, the, the, the switches, the virtual switches, they could program the robot to move remotely. 
And I did do a performance for five hours continuously, positioned on the torso of the robot. Um, I could animate the robot uh, limbs with a pair of pneumatic joysticks. Um, and I was responding, improvising to the local interaction in the gallery and the remote interaction online. You have to imagine this is an acoustical uh, landscape of compressed air, of the muscles um, inflating and contracting, extending and exhausting. So the compressed air sounds, the solenoid clicks and the whirring of the rot rotational motor. When I th thought of this uh, performance, I imagined uh, as a, I imagined as a kind of contemporary pieta, you know, a, a small human body on a much larger robot body. Uh, but Nina Sellers more astutely observed that the body here is merely a human strap-on for the robot. <laughs> and uh, for the Science Gallery in Melbourne, uh, I'm a artist in residence there at the moment, uh, in collaboration with Paul Lowe and David Leggett, uh, designer and architect. We're engineering an anthropomorphic uh, machine. Um, this is a robotic uh, structure that has pneumatic rubber muscles, a deformable uh, skeletal, skeletal tensegrity uh, structure, and a vision system that detects when someone approaches the installation. Um, the vision system detects the person's proximity, their position, and their, their movements. And this generates uh, pulsing, swaying, or glitching uh, behavior with the deforming uh, tensegrity structure. So the choreography uh, of the of the, the movements of the uh, structure composes uh, the sounds that are generated. And finally, in 2011, uh, the first twin turbine heart was inserted into the chest of a terminally ill patient. Uh, this is a, a more robust, more reliable, smaller artificial heart. It circulates the blood continuously without pulsing. So in the near future, you might rest your head on your loved one's chest. They're breathing, they're sighing, they're speaking, they're certainly alive, but they have no heartbeat. So imagine a population of humans without heartbeats, without a pulse. So what's happening here? The dead, the brain dead, the partially living, the yet to be born, the prosthetically augmented and synthetic life all now share a material and proximal existence with other living bodies, intelligent machines and executable and viral code. And the realm of the digital is this realm of flattened ontologies. The body individually achieves planetary escape velocity, but the human can no longer achieve escape velocity from the machinic and digital realm. And the body's experience of the self can only now be increasingly synthetic. What it means to be human then is perhaps not to remain human at all. And I think what artists do best is to generate contingent and contestable uh, futures, possibilities that can be uh, performed, that can be uh, um, experienced personally, that can be interrogated, evaluated, possibly appropriated, most likely discarded. And we have to remember that a future it does not happen of necessity. A future is always contingent. 
uh, a future is not a future if it is not of the unexpected. And a selection of video links to the performances that I've mentioned. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was provocative. That was interesting. And I'm sure a lot of us have a lot many questions. And I am going to um, start with a question that has come from Chandru. And following which I will abuse my position as moderating this session and ask a question myself. So Chandru's question is, uh, when bandwidth approaches 10 Gbps expected with 6G in about 10 years, this would then approach human vision resolution. What could be... Uh, of course, that's an interesting question. And we do... Um, I try to keep in touch with... Um, recent technological developments, state-of-the-art uh, te technologies and, and uh, speculations into, into how these might, you know, exponentially uh, uh, develop in the future. Um, the problem, of course, is that um, to do anything invasive with the body, um, it's very, very difficult to... Uh, convince the medical community um, mm. to assist um, artists. Uh, uh, the medical community is essentially uh, conservative. Um, you know, th their, their business is um, curing illnesses, uh, patching up uh, traumatised and damaged bodies. Um, they have little time, uh, you know, to, to, to assist artists to do what is essentially an unnecessary action. Um, having said that, I think um, what's interesting about artists is that they uh, hack new technologies and they use technologies in, in unexpected and creative ways. Um, so there are possibilities that uh, will... Uh, veer increasingly now, especially with um, more miniaturized and biocompatible devices, that increasingly technology will be implanted uh, beneath the skin in, in the internal uh, spaces and even in the cellular spaces of the, of the body. And we can really begin thinking about seriously uh, redesigning the, the, the human body. So, uh, but, you know, as an artist, um, uh, I'm not so interested in speculating mm -hmm. if I can't uh, realise or actualise the idea. So uh, even if that actualization is, is, is rather uh, simplistic, uh, all, the, all of these projects and performances should be characterised as aesthetic gestures as to possible uh, futures. Uh, they're not about serious uh, scientific research. Um, you know, artists don't have the, 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 the funding. They don't have the institutional support, generally speaking, uh, to do five-year research projects. <laughs> um, so uh, I think... Um, Yes, as bandwidth increases, as technology becomes more uh, biocompatible, both in scale and in substance, then yes, uh, we'll be able to mess with our sensory and cognitive uh, capabilities. Um, these are certainly possibilities, but as I mentioned, they should be seen as contingent and contestable uh, and not that they will necessarily uh, happen uh, just because we believe in Moore's law or, or we uh, have um, 
uh, sort of dystopian notions of a singularity or or stuff like that. Okay, so I will go back to um, a rather old band you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, Take Part. Oh. And for those who are not philosophers in this room, I in two sentences, let me capture the famous mind-body problem. Descartes argued that the nature of the mind, that is, it is a thinking non-extended thing, is completely different from that of the body, that is an extended or extendable non-thinking thing. And therefore, it is possible for one to exist without the other. And it's so what so what I would like so I so so that, and of course. Um, I would like to hear your take on Descartes a little more elaborated, but also you made a provocative statement at the beginning, and that is very only, only one, only one no. provocative. <laughs> no, but the, one of the many provocative statements that you made towards the beginning, where you said, and, and that's especially relevant for this exhibition season that we are launching today, you said that the body is no longer the site for the psyche. And so what I want you to explore for us is in this extendable, extended, disembodied mind, uh, body sort of, you know, equation that you're working with, what is the location of the psyche? Where do you place it? And how do you frame the mind-body problem for yourself? What, you know, who does what to the body? Where does agency lie, if at all? And if, if like Wittgenstein or Nietzsche, you're saying the agency is the act itself, then do we have a mind at all? <laughs> well, the, you know, I'm not a philosopher. Um, so all I can speak of is, is um, the ideas that have been generated from these projects and performances. And of course, um, sometimes a friend will, will say, oh, well, you should read uh, you should read Schopenhauer or Descartes or Wittgenstein or Nietzsche. Um, and, I, you know, my reading is not methodical um, and I haven't got a PhD in philosophy. Uh, so um, uh, these ideas are, are, are generated um, in, 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 rather, in, in rather poetic ways rather than in, 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 in um, you know, strictly philosophical uh, terminology, um, but the feeling of this person is that um, the, the idea of mind or self or previously the, the notion of, of a soul was a convenient uh, construct to explain certain behaviours or certain um, uh, certain rituals uh, or certain misunderstandings of the world, um, you know, that things couldn't move if gods were not moving them, you know, or, or if we didn't have gods moving them, there must be some homunculus inside the body that moves me. Um, and then, of course, with Descartes, uh, we tend to focus more on you know the the brain as the site of of the mind from Descartes onwards, and of course Descartes is an important philosopher, and uh, I think each philosopher uh, uh, sort of uh, explains uh, a point of view that has to be taken into account, but uh, should not be evaluated um, uh, either as true or false. Uh, I mean, um, it has a use value is what I'm saying. You know, um, so my mother, for example, uh, on the death of my father, uh, religion had a use value. Um, it helped her overcome her grief. Uh, it helped her to believe that there may be some after life. But whether uh, religious belief has a truth value uh, that's a different question. So I think with uh, philosophy, the same sort of criteria can be applied, that all philosophy has a, a kind of use value uh, that we can um, 
that provides a means to modify, modulate, adjust, add to, subtract from. Um, so, but, but the word mind, for example, or the word self, to me is simply a word. You know, to understand, uh, to understand the world, we, we, we use words to, um, to categorize, to, to name objects or to, to categorize a behavior. Mm -hmm. So instead of thinking of the mind as a verb, we, we begin to think of it as a noun, as, as, as something that intrinsically uh, exists inside our head. Um, and I think this is a, a problem of language. I think um, language uh, clarifies the world, but many times it confuses us philosophically because in, in naming the world, in categorizing the world, um, we, we, we generate these confusions and we turn uh, behaviors into intrinsic essences. Mm -hmm. But then what would you say inform behaviors? Because there seems to be well, well, a logic to it. Well, I think it's a complex interplay. Mm -hmm. It's a con interplay. I mean, the body is, it has evolved um, to uh, be constantly interactive uh, with its environment, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and we've developed organs uh, to 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 uh, uh, to input um, uh, so sound wave, so compressions of air that are translated into sounds or light that are translated into images, um, and we have the the sort of uh, neuronal computational capabilities of of um, analyzing this input of information. And then being able to respond. So I think it's it's the result of a complex interplay of feedback loops between the external world, the environment, and the organism uh, that is um, uh, uh, performing in that world. And mm -hmm. if if the if that if that organism doesn't perform adequately, it will eventually go extinct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, having said that, the human species, just like any other species, is probably destined for extinction. Mm -hmm. And given that fact, uh, we should uh, plan and plot an elegant exit. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, you have us unraveled and soon you will have us extinct. <laughs> um, we, we well, I, I think I think the <laughs> subtitle of Psyche uh, is really is really um, is really uh, provocative, uh, especially the the you know the unthinking, the unraveling, the unthinking. I think if art doesn't generate a certain ambivalence, a certain uncertainty that necessitates further questioning, which yeah. good science does also. Yes. Um, I mean, uh, good science generates information that um, forces us to construct new paradigms of, of, of how the world works. Um, so anything of interest will, will be unsettling uh, and unravelling, uh, and, and we should be able to cope with that. Yes, no, absolutely. So it's it's my it's my fabulous team that came up with the with the with the three words, and uh, no, you know, um, is exactly as you said. You know, I think what we don't have in the public domain is an appreciation for the uncertainty also in the truth claim made by science, and that that it is un that knowledge in, is uncertain, and that uncertainty generates new questions, and therein yeah. lies the beauty of it. And therein lies the beauty of art, because both are creative processes. And I think they function differently. But I think we, we, we need to develop a far more, I mean, before we go extinct, of course, 
a far a, a far sort of deeper appreciation um, for the for the ability of both. So we have one of our um, audience members wondering: these installations that you showed are so complex and provocative. How big are the teams that create them, and what is their expertise? <laughs> Um, well, it, it really varies. I, I don't have, you know, I'm not a, uh, uh, I'm a performance artist rather than an artist that is part of the art economy. So um, I don't have a large, you know, warehouse studio. Mm -hmm. um, if my installations are not being exhibited, they're packed away in boxes in commercial storage facilities, unfortunately. Um, uh, the the projects vary. So, for example, uh, the exoskeleton walking robot was engineered when I was artist in residence of Hamburg City in Germany. And uh, at the time, I was expected to do a performance at the end of my residency, which was only six months. Um, and uh, I discovered I had a budget of 50,000 Deutschmark at the time. <laughs> um, and 50, that, that was a lot of money for me. So I, I said, I convinced the curator, instead of spending that money on production, on lighting, on sound equipment, uh, couldn't we spend that money uh, engineering a, a six-legged walking robot and uh, I can perform with it at the, um, at the end of my residency? Of course, I didn't know that we could finish this robot <laughs> nor that it would successfully walk. <laughs> but um, with the help of uh, four artists who were also sort of engineers, um, we were able to complete the project actually in probably less than three months um, because it took a lot of time to, to get the, the thing happening uh, to... to satisfied with the design and it was really a hands-on literally a hands-on engineering project um, uh, for example with the anthropomorphic machine here at the science gallery in melbourne uh, two key people from the design school and uh, and an architect um, but um, uh, a couple of phd students are assisting with programming um, uh, a couple of other students are assisting with uh, the the web the web programming. Um, so uh, the team is different with every uh, different project, and uh, it depends where I am, uh, whether there is a budget. Sometimes it's not a, a about money; it's about institutional support. Or, for example, with the 12 pneumatic rubber muscles, two and a half metre long for the anthropomorphic machine, uh, the company Festo uh, is assisting yeah. with that. And we're getting a lot of that equipment uh, at, a, at a very low cost. So um, it depends how you organise, supervise um, these, these projects. The, the most difficult project to organise was the the extra ear project, and um, you know it took ten years. Uh, the idea first was in 1996. It took ten years to find three surgeons and to to get the funding, and then there's been uh, another surgery a few years ago that was unsuccessful. So you can't assume that everything you do that's a surgical uh, uh, procedure on your body is going to be successful. So, um, and uh, there's still the, the augmentation of the ear still hasn't happened. So it's very frustrating, but it's partly a state of the art problem and partly a funding problem. Um, if you had unlimited money to throw at this project, then it might happen quicker. But then you're not making an atomic bomb. So <laughs> I have a question here from Andrew Carney, who is also, uh, you know. Uh, yes, I know Andrew. Yes, exactly. So allow me to read his question. Um, 
what credence do you give to our environment as we might develop as humans slash robots? Some people call it cyborgs. The body as we know it is created very much as a product of an interrelation, interaction of our genetic development and the complex environment we inhabit. We are completely yes. interdependent on this exchange. Can we produce anything new without our environment? Yes. Do we need well, to I'm concentrate it on it as it is now? And does your work reflect this interdependence? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think uh, that's absolutely the case. Uh, but uh, we no longer uh, being biological bodies, essentially, uh, who've evolved, you know, over billions of years uh, from, um, into the creatures that we are now. Um, we did this uh, in, a, in, a, in a natural environment. But the last 5,000 years, our environment has become increasingly um, technological. Um, so now the body inhabits um, a much more complex technological environment, um, which is sort of superimposed over its We can now uh, intervene uh, genetically intervene, uh, for example, the CRISPR, uh, technology make uh, facilitates genetic intervention, um, and we can increasingly um, augment the body with uh, technological prosthetic attachments, but also um, with um, you know internal, internally implanted uh, chips and and devices. Uh, this is already happening for medical reasons. Uh, the other person I met. In, in Paris, I didn't actually meet him, but, uh, but he was on stage, um, was a person who had Parkinson's disease. And they showed a video of, of him uh, before uh, the medical intervention. And he was just shaking controllably. He couldn't dress himself. He couldn't feed himself. He was just shaking uh, violently. But with um, a device implanted in, 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 to, in his brain, um, it subdued the, the, the kind of um, the brainwave activity that was uh, resulting in, in the Parkinson's um, uh, disease. And he was sitting on stage, uh, completely normal, uh, completely uh, capable of um, uh, everyday activities. Um, so, um, and... Uh, um, not only, uh, uh, I think it's uh, John Rogers at the University of Illinois has developed uh, not only flexible uh, uh, chip circuitry that can be uh, simply stuck to the skin and it's deformable so it can stick, um, uh, it doesn't need a flat surface. It mm -hmm. still operates even though it's deformed, uh, but he's also recently developed biodegradable, deformable chip circuitry. So if you have, for example, something pathological wrong, uh, wrong with your, your heart, you can stick this uh, chip um, on the surface of your heart. Uh, a month later, it'll harmlessly biodegrade inside your body. So um, we, we now inhabit a technological terrain we now have an array of new instruments uh, and, and new knowledge that enables us to, um, to you know, do we accept uh, the biological status quo or do we uh, examine the human body objectively and say, well, yes, it's a very complex analog uh, system, uh, but you know, it has to constantly breathe air. I have to constantly gulp air to keep alive. I can't do without water for a week. I have to drink water at least a couple of times a week. Um, I have to eat at least a month or, or, or my health is at risk. 
um, my heart has to beat millions of times during my 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 ninety years of of life uh, to keep me existing for that period of time. I can be fatally infected by microbial uh, 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 viruses and bacteria that are invisible to me. I'm I'm vulnerable. I'm easily damaged. Um, I'm easily contaminated and infected. And um, yes, the body is complex. Yes, we can poetically and in a Heideggerian sense, we can say that, oh, um, uh, uh, our existence is, is, is really uh, prefaced on our death. Mm. Or we can say that, well, you know, it takes at least 60 years to get wise to yourself, <laughs> then you quickly deteriorate and die. <laughs> it sounds rather irrational to me. <laughs> okay, I yeah. If what it, what still intrigues me, and I and I'm, I'm I hope this is only the beginning of a la- of of a much longer conversation, uh, is that how do we? And 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 of course, just just to add that uh, what is a is a medical procedure today, uh, what is a plastic surgery today becomes a cosmetic surgery tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I may not want just a face lift. I may want a face transplant. (laughs) Um, I, I mean, and that's a plausible expectation, you know, because once we, um, solve the problem of immunological response or put it another way we're already beginning to 3d print with um, cells derived from our stem cells we could plausibly 3d print a flexible uh, facial skin um, that would allow us to uh, uh, have a face transplant with no immunological problems at all so you know these these things. You know, uh, applaud. But I, I agree um, with Andrew that we've always required an interaction with our environment. It's just now an environment that is increasingly more complex and technological, which allows us to intervene both genetically and instrumentally, um, uh, even with our our computer, even with our cognitive, I mean, we can't now do without our wireless devices or our computational uh, systems. Um, we we uh, extend uh, storage that we would have had to have done in our brains. We now store information in our phones, in our laptops. Um, yeah. No, wonderful. Um, we've had a wonderfully provocative few moments with you, and we trust this conversation will continue. We've understood that, that we've, we've begun on a journey of enhancement, not just of the body, but also of cognition. And therefore, that this, is, uh, this path is, is uncertain, this path is, is uh, interesting, and this path is uh, going to unfold in ways in which we are going to not easily able to predict. So thank you, Stilak, so much for allowing us to begin Psyche on a provocative note, um, what happens to our minds. And thank you, Chandru, for your, for your fantastic you know, remarks and bringing in the man who actually connected um, you know, for us in, in most obvious ways, at least in the 20th century, the mind and the machine. And so here we are um, coming to the close of the, of the inaugural event and Psyche has been launched. Thank you for being with us this evening, Stalak and Chandru both. Um, for our audiences, I'm sorry that we couldn't take all your questions, um, but do come back. We have a 45 day program ahead of us and uh, many of whom you heard today will, will also be seen in the program ahead. So thank you again and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chandru. Thank you. Thank you, Stalak. Thank you.